Excellent. Again, you're all very welcome. We'd like to begin this webinar with a word of prayer. So uh, I'd like to invite Jackie in one day to lead us in prayer as we begin. Jackie, over to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, we worship you, God, because out of heaven you have let us hear your voice to discipline. We worship you, God, because you instruct us and teach us in the way we should go. You counsel us with your eye on us. Oh God, we worship you because you have taught us from our youth and we still declare your wondrous deeds. We worship you, Lord, because of all the wisdom, knowledge, understanding and power you have given us because of your grace and mercy. Lord, we worship you because you are the beginning and the end. We are just the dash in between. Heavenly Father, we worship you because with you, all things are possible. This morning, as we gather, Heavenly Father, we ask that you will open our hearts and our minds and you will show us great and unsearchable things that we do not know. Dear God, we ask that your spirit shall rest upon us, that the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the, wisdom, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of you as we discuss this morning and share shall be upon us. Heavenly Father, we pray that we shall be anointed so that we will abound in knowledge. Give our panelists wisdom, dear God, so that from their mouths shall come knowledge and understanding. Lord, we pray this morning that there shall be no interruption of any kind. We ask, Lord, that the network shall be clear. We ask, Lord, that the power shall stay on. We pray, Heavenly Father, that every participant shall be alert, that there shall be no distraction of any form, that we will be awake, that those who have been busy and are exhausted, their energy shall be renewed this morning. Lord, we ask that this time shall be a wonderful time of revelation and discernment. Heavenly Father, your word says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. May our minds, spirits, and soul be subdued to your power and lordship. Lord, we surrender this time to you, and we ask you to instruct us in the way we should go. We receive the Holy Spirit anointing and guidance in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we pray that every single person this morning shall be alert, shall be engaged, shall be connected. And everybody that is behind in charge of the technical work, we pray, Lord, for grace and anointing upon their hands. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. I'd like to go very quickly through uh, the guests that we have. Uh, Jackie did pray Jackie. for our panelists and the Jackie. panelists we have. We have a special guest, Dr. Uh, Kedres to the agenda uh, from Education Standards. Uh, we have four discussants, Mr. Douglas Opio, Mr. Patrick Kaboyo, Mr. Philbert Baguma, Professor uh, John Mugisha. And I uh, will receive a presentation very soon from Mrs. Lona Magara. So uh, those are the people you should expect to hear from uh, during this webinar. Uh, there are a few more that I will introduce a little later. Uh, Yes, but for now, uh, if you receive the program, that's who we have on the program. And uh, right now, I'd like to invite Professor uh, Joseph Onyu, who is uh, going to welcome us on behalf of CASO. Uh, and CASO is the one that has put together this webinar. Professor Onyu, you are welcome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gabriel. Um, Participants and panelists, uh, you're most welcome to this webinar. I'm extremely excited. This is really a good opportunity. And as the theme goes, we should be able to thrive even amidst uh, what we now uh, are going through. Um, on behalf of Castle Think Tank, I would like to thank you for taking time to come to this webinar. Um, Castle Think Tank is an agency that is committed to solving the problems in this country in all spheres of life. Last year, we launched it 
uh, officially with the blessings of the First Lady and the Right Honorable Prime Minister. Um, I would like to thank all the organizers, um, Kathy, uh, Dr. Magara, and all the people behind the technical bit. I know the panelists very well. Um, Mrs. Lona Magara is uh, a seasoned educator um, and um, she's currently the, um, the chairperson of the Governing Council of Makere, Patrick Kavoyo from Pene, Philbert Baguma, Professor Mugisha, Mr. Pio, and our special guest and sister, Kedres. Uh, Kedres is, by the way, also a, a chemistry teacher. So I would like to thank and welcome all those panelists. I think we're going to have a very interesting interaction. I appreciate Gabriel for always being available and spicy in his moderation. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, capturing all the deliberations so that we take this to uh, a different level. Thank you very much and welcome all the participants. Thank you very much, Gabriel, Professor. Over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Onyu. I'm looking at the numbers of uh, the participants and the numbers keep growing. So I think it's prudent that again, I say good morning and you are all very welcome to this webinar organized by the Center for Advanced Strategic Leadership. Most of us know it as CASO. Uh, this webinar is under the theme COVID-19 Opportunity to Thrive. This is the second webinar in a series of webinars uh, on various sectors and uh, what opportunities can be harnessed from what COVID-19 has revealed. And today, we will focus on the education sector. The education sector is a tool for building a person in many aspects. Uh, if well handled and planned for, this sector can lead to a more productive and relevant workforce. This sector, like others, uh, has been affected by COVID-19. And we shall all recall that the first lockdown measure was the closure of education institutions. I believe this was on March the 20th. The closure has affected the education sector in many ways. And uh, today we will discuss how the sector can thrive in these times. We're going to begin uh, by receiving a presentation, uh, a presentation on a presentation on you know what Castle has come up with in relation to the education sector. For those of you that were present at last week's webinar, we're informed that uh, these discussions we're going to be having were informed uh, from a long webinar that had around 33 different sectors. And uh, one of them is the education sector. And the person going to take us through uh, the think piece from uh, the education sector is Mrs. Uh, Lona Magara. She has been actively engaged in the world of education for over 15 years. She's a strong believer in education being a, transform, uh, a transformational process that impacts the whole of a life and a key determinant in the formation of the character and quality of society. Mrs. Magara holds a Bachelor of Arts in Education from Makere University, a Master of Arts in Organizational Leadership and Management from Uganda Christian University in Mukono, she homeschooled her four children for three years and later founded Vine International Christian Academy in 2005 as an alternative system of education that takes into consideration the unique needs of the individual learner while providing a curriculum that has its three key pillars as wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. She's the principal of Vine International Christian Academy. Earlier, Mrs. Magara worked in the Human Resource Department of the National Social Security Fund, NSSF, and led the team that set up the training unit. She has served on several governing bodies uh, of education institutions and also helped uh, many start, school, uh, start schools, I beg your pardon. In 2018, she was elected the chairperson of Makere University Council, a position she currently holds. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me, Mrs. Lona Magara. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Good morning, uh, my fellow 
Yes, my fellow participants um, and panelists, thank you very much for joining us on this uh, webinar. And to all those that are out listening, uh, welcome, welcome. It's a very exciting time to be alive. Thank you, Castle, for providing an opportunity for all of us to look out for the opportunities that uh, COVID-19 has presented. Today, as we look at uh, education, like Gabriel has said, education is an essential part of society. It's a tool that provides people with values, knowledge and skills. It enables them to know their rights and duties toward their family, society, as well as the nation. When the education system of any society fails, numerous social problems like poor health, internal conflict, poor living standards, and many more result. A good education makes an individual, society, or nation more competitive. Sorry, my screen has just been interrupted. Just give me a second, please. All right, I'm back on. Just to say a good education makes an individual and society or nation more competitive in an increasingly globalized world. Education globally has been profoundly impacted by COVID-19 and the pandemic has cast a dark cloud over the society and over this sector in, in, in particular. Several gaps have been exposed and challenges posed but as the saying goes, every dark cloud has a silver lining. These workshops are focusing on the silver lining, the opportunities presented that once harnessed can bring the education sector to a better place and produce the human resource that will drive national transformation. And that's what we want to focus on today. Briefly, I want us to first list some of the challenges and gaps that have been exposed before we delve into the opportunities created. And the main focus is going to really be on the opportunities. Now, some of the gaps and challenges that have been exposed include the lack of readiness in the education sector to handle the unique challenges presented by the pandemic. We did not have a business continuity plan or risk management plan to handle the pandemic, even after seeing what had happened was happening in China. Secondly, there was the over-reliance on classroom instruction. For many of us, education up to date only takes place in class. So when we were not able to go to class, we were stuck with what to do with learning. Third, there was the limited online um, learning of learning aids. Most of our teaching material is in printed, in, in printed uh, material and most even at, lect at a high school level. When you look at what happens in universities, the lecturers present their notes, which then the students photocopy. So there's very limited online learning aids. The other gap that was uh, presented was the inequality in access to ICT resources. Despite the government's substantial investment in ICT infrastructure and the increase in mobile phone coverage across the country, ICT has not been appreciated as an alternative mode to facilitate learning. Coupled with that was the poor capacity among teachers and lecturers as a whole with regard to ICT. The focus of several staff development initiatives in the tertiary sector in Uganda so far has been on advanced master's and doctoral degree qualifications. Not many have invested in knowing what to do with um, ICT as far as delivery of, of instruction is concerned. Another gap that was um, exposed was the hesitancy in adopting novel ways of learning and instruction. For many, this is a new area and therefore there's the fear and hesitancy to even try out these new platforms. We've had so many platforms, Zoom, Teams, and so on. And the, the adopting of all these new areas for instruction and training has been, uh, has been slow. Another gap that we have seen is the poor infrastructure support systems. Um, access to electricity and online connectivity. Sometimes you're online and, 
and the network drops the call or sometimes the electricity is not on. And so there's the poor infrastructure does not support the online system so far. Coupled with that was that parents were really not ready and not trained or ill-equipped to support their children in the learning process. It was such a sudden shift that not many even knew what to do with children at home. So these are some of the gaps that uh, were presented, the challenges that we've experienced. But like I've said, we want to now focus on the opportunities. What can we do with what is include? And definitely the list is uh, not exhaustive, but some of these include the opportunity to switch to online learning. So far, almost all our teaching materials, like I said, have been on printed paper, thus limiting their usage to only those that can access the print. There is now a golden opportunity to increase access to education by digitalizing of learning aids and making them available at subsidized rates. When you go online, you go, you cross borders, you cross borders of the classroom, you cross borders of districts, you're able to reach so many more students, so many more learners across the country. The other opportunity is that we, are, it, we should be able to bolster the online and offline platforms for delivery of, of curricula. The ministry has taken lead in this and we want to appreciate them by putting the learning material in uh, learning packages that have been sent out, but also in using the radio and, and TV media to reach um, the learners wherever they are. We, we have an opportunity to bolster this. We have an opportunity to upgrade our teachers online and distance instruction skills by mandatory ICT training to enable them adapt to new methods of learning, instruction, and delivery. We have the opportunity to provide collaborative learning, especially at tertiary level. With institutional subscriptions, students can access reading materials from libraries across the world. Our own research publications and journals can likewise be available to the rest of the world. Apart from the opportunity to switch to online learning, we're able to adopt to homeschool model, a homeschool model. Many schools in this lockdown period have been forced to adopt some form of distance learning. The challenge is that there has been no organized support system for studying at home. The pandemic has provided the opportunity to translate our curriculum into study packages. There is now need to develop a system to support this method of learning by preparing and training of the parents and establishing parameters for assessment. This should continue beyond the pandemic. The third area that we can um, develop here is that we can roll out the learning into virtual classroom platforms. COVID-19 has pushed the classroom out of the four walls. This should only gain momentum. Minister of Education should work on setting up systems to support this. For example, we could explore the possibility of using churches, mosques, and other local community venues as virtual classrooms. Many of these are underutilized and even closed during the weekdays. This offers the possibility of standardizing the delivery of content across the country, as one teacher can potentially teach thousands of students at the same time. And another opportunity that has presented is a, is a, a synchronous learning. Now in a synchronous education, we are not limited in time and space. Content can be recorded and stored for use when the learner is ready. The pandemic has created demand for this type of learning because of the varying dynamics in homes. Not all homes are structured the same way. Some will start with work 
within the home or a trade or even in the market or some will start in the gardens and then they want to come home and be able to settle down and study. If we have this content recorded and stored, then the learner will be able to sit and study when they're ready to study. Another opportunity has been that we can now revisit our assessment methodologies that we have currently had. And the lockdown has presented a challenge for the candidate classes. And if the pandemic were to spread in the country, forcing institutions to close again or remain closed, what will happen to the final exams? The formative assessment approach can help us in such circumstances. The crisis caused by the pandemic presents an opportunity to invest in building the capacity of education institutions at all levels to adapt to continuous assessment. This approach um, as opposed to the summative approach, recognizes prior learning, prior knowledge that learners acquire from their day-to-day -day environment in the home and community. It also provides for mastery of learning. The child or learner will only be able to move to the next uh, module once they have been assessed and, uh, and know the material. Then they can move on to the next level. This will shift the focus from being exam-centered to learning-centered. Another shift that we can consider is to adopt to a double shift system. Now, the standard operating procedures during the pandemic have required social distancing. The challenge of large numbers of learners in a classroom can be overcome by adopting a double shift system especially for the lower and secondary classes. This will decongest the schools, ensuring social distance. For example, you, we can agree and say, look, the learners from primary one to three can study in the morning hours. And then in the afternoon, we have the primary four and seven come to class. The same principle can apply to secondary schools. Later, when the pandemic wins, the system avails an opportunity to increase intake of students and therefore have many more learners across the country come into a school. The other option we have that we can uh, consider is having re resetting the calendar, the, the annual school calendar to a two semester system of 15 weeks each. Currently, the annual school calendar runs on a three-term system for all institutions except universities. The proposed reset to a two-semester system has the following benefits. It improves development of study habits in learners. They have the opportunity to learn without the pressure of studying for exams or tests within a few weeks of getting to school. The learners also have longer holidays that make for meaningful engagement in pre-vocational and vocational exposure. Exposure to pre-vocational work is the best way to promote TIVET. And now TIVET is the technical vocational education training as a career. Since the holiday of 22 weeks is long enough, it gives flexibility to schools to efficiently utilize the limited classroom and sanitation infrastructure available in the schools by having various classes attend school in alternate semesters. With this arrangement, again, for example, when you have primary one to four at school, the upper classes five to seven can be on holiday. This arrangement can be, can, has the following profound benefits. It reduces congestion in classrooms, improving the actual student to classroom ratio. It also improves the individual attention to learners, since at any one time, only half the school population will be in the school. It maximizes the utilization of school facilities as opposed to having them empty or redundant for almost 40% of the time in the term system arrangement. Now we also have, um, COVID has presented an opportunity to provide the infrastructure for the new modes of learning. These that I've just presented need an infrastructure that will support their operation. 
Now, the cost of broadband internet in Uganda is still exorbitant and out of reach for individuals and many education institutions. For example, as of December 2019, according to the Uganda Communication Commission, for mobile internet in Uganda, one would have to pay US dollars 2.67 per month for the same volume of inter internet data compared with 2.4 US dollars in Kenya and then Tanzania, it's US 2.8 dollars and in Rwanda 2.18 dollars. Now for an institution such as a school, the monthly cost of a dedicated line of broadband internet is about $180 within Kampala or $205 outside Kampala. Not many schools can afford this. In the medium term, government can help bring down the cost of accessing broadband internet by one, incentivizing telecoms, by assisting them with the cost of inputs for setting internet infrastructure. Also, by extending broadband internet to all public education institutions, organized private settlements and neighborhoods. This will, in the long run, increase the number of broadband internet users, thus drive the prices down. The other great opportunity that we have now is one of producing manpower for manufacturing and industry. One of the criticisms of our education system has been that the graduates do not have the requisite skills needed for employment. While our education is heavy on content and low on skills training. COVID-19 has highlighted the need to develop local solutions for the needs in society. This crisis presents an opportunity to position the technical vocational training system as the driver of innovation and employment. This will enable us harness the power of innovation and design curricula that is responsive to local challenges. And to do this, we need to bring the vision of TIVET, the technical and vocational training. We need to bring that vision in basic education and then link higher education with lower education. This will ensure continuity in the training. We also need to change the mindset. What is currently pertaining is that when you opt to do a technical course, you're seen many times to be a failure. Um, you've not been able to get into college or into university. Now you've gone to a substandard place. You've gone to a technical college. That is a wrong mindset and that we need to change. To do this, we need to collaborate with the media to promote the benefits of technical institutions. The same way the campaigns were done for HIV AIDS in the 1990s, similar campaigns can be done to sell BitVet. We need to reconsider the funding options available. Government um, should extend a loan scheme to TVET students. At least two thirds of government student loan schemes should be ring fenced for students aspiring to join TVET. Funding should also be extended to the private tertiary institutions. We can consider an apprenticeship framework, develop one that provides tax incentives for those who offer work opportunities and other subsidies. This will enable students hone their skills under expert supervision. TVET has the greatest impact in creating immediate employment opportunities and driving economic transformation. Public student loans are, more sustain, are a more sustainable way of public funding to increase access to higher education world over. Then if government was to identify the priority skills that are needed, then we can focus on the development of the requisite human resource capacity over the medium and long term. One of the other proposals is that the policy that, for TVET that was passed by cabinet in 2019 needs to be revitalized, needs to be activated. Um, in this policy, we see a, a need to, to revitalize community polytechnics and technical schools because they are located closest to the grassroots and have quick turnaround time 
for skilling opportunities for young people. In addition, this policy provides for participation of the private sector in TVET implementation, right from the design of the curricula to providing training opportunities such as internship and apprenticeship. The other area that can be revisited is that most research in the country is donor driven and is not aligned with the needs of the country. We need to refocus our research for social impact. All right. And at the same time, increase local funding. Mrs. Magara, I know you're drawing to uh, your conclusion. Uh, just a reminder that you, you have two minutes. All right. So this funding of research in higher education institutions should address societal needs rather than majoring on just knowledge. And we can develop frameworks that encourage the research to be funded by government and by the private sector. Finally, and definitely not least, to ease the tax burden on the private educational institutions, about 80% of the educational institutions in the country are private owned. Private education institutions depend on tuition fees for all their operations. Now, due to the lockdown, parents have not been working, therefore revenues are not guaranteed for these private institutions. At best, there will be delayed payment, yet the schools have to operate uh, to pay salaries and all the, the other costs involved. Government and the private sector are encouraged to come to the table. On the one hand, government needs to take a keen interest in the educational standards and content provided by these private practitioners on the other hand, since the private institutions carry a very large part of the government's mandate to provide education, they ought to provide to, to offer a tax relief. The tax burden on these institutions is high and limits their ability to reinvest and diversify the sector. In this COVID-19 season, government would consider providing tax relief for private schools and education institutions with no penalty on the delayed payments. As we consider the future of education, the importance of collaboration cannot be overstated. Government and the private sector must come together around the common goal of an educated populace. Together, we can create a new paradigm that will see Uganda transform. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mrs. Magara. And uh, it's, it's, uh, this webinar is the beginning uh, because we've brought together government and private sector to have a conversation about the education sector. Mrs. Magara, again, thank you very much. We will be coming back to you with questions because the questions have already started streaming in and uh, they're quite a number. Uh, participants, I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom of your screen. There is uh, a tab labeled Q and A. Feel free to use that tab to direct a question to any of the panelists. On the screen right now is a poll question. Every 30 or so minutes, we will have a poll question. Please respond to uh, what you see on your screen. Choose any of the options. Read the question and choose any of the options. I can see poll results already coming in. They're moving very quickly. Yes, and we will see the results. The question uh, is, has the government's intervention for continuity of schooling during the lockdown had the desired effect? At the moment, a uh, majority of the people are saying to a limited extent. At least that's what my screen is allowing me to see. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, panelists, unfortunately, you cannot vote. You are the electoral commission in this case. So please, let's, uh, for panelists, just, uh, yes, look at what's on your screen. <laughs> you are not an eligible voter. I'd like to uh, recognize the presence of uh, Professor Nawangwe, the vice chancellor of Makere University. He has joined this webinar via Facebook. It's a good time for me to remind you that we are streaming on Facebook and YouTube as well. So uh, if you, uh, for those who could not join via the Zoom call, we are on Facebook and YouTube. All right, we also have uh, Mrs. Allen Kajina is uh, watching. We have, I think one or two members of parliament. We are glad for everybody who is joining this conversation. And like you've heard, uh, the education sector is key because it determines the kind of people uh, we have and it has an effect on every part uh, of our economy. All right, we need to move to uh, our next discussant. Well, let's see the final results of the poll. Uh, 
7% of you said to a great extent, given the challenges faced. Uh, 46%, the majority say to a limited extent, uh, and then 17% say government needs needs to be completely overhauled. So the uh, you know the continuity continuity of schooling during the lockdown, the way it has been implemented needs to be completely overhauled. Thank you very much. Uh, later on, there will be another poll question, so please uh, participate in it. When Mrs. Magara was presenting, a couple of times she referred to, you know, uh, TVET and uh, skills for employment, the mismatch between the graduates that are churned out and uh, the skills that are needed in the labor market. So I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Douglas Opio. Uh, Mr. Douglas Opio is the executive director of the Federation of Uganda Employers. He serves as a member on uh, various steering committees and boards, including ILO Global Business Network on Forced Labor, Save for Health Uganda, and TVET Policy Implementation Working Group. Mr. Opio is an experienced labor and employment expert with a demonstrated history in, the, in working with the local and international uh, employers. He is skilled in business, industrial relations, and nonprofit organizations, uh, sustainable development, East African community regional integration, um, public speaking, resource mobilization, and I could go on and on. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's welcome Mr. Douglas Opio. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel. Uh, it's a huge pleasure for me to join this webinar. And thank you so much, uh, uh, Lorna, for that uh, very clear presentation. I'm extremely grateful. Uh, what you put across is basically that we need to rethink our education system and, and whether we, we are relevant uh, to the current times. I'll just uh, respond to a few issues uh, that you raised. Thank you, Ms. First is uh, the issue of exposure to vocational education and training at an early age. Uh, this is also within the framework of what we have been uh, conceived within our TVET policy. It's already something that is done elsewhere. Uh, the Chinese do the same. Uh, in Singapore, they do the same. So exposure to, uh, edu to technical and vocational education at an early age is extremely important. Actually, TVET is not just the traditional TVET, but even the modern day uh, TVET, essentially robotics, issues of artificial intelligence. Uh, so it's not only just about being mechanics. So that's extremely important if you, uh, to be competitive enough. Secondly, issue of uh, considering a double shift system. I think it's a very brilliant idea, uh, but we would still need to address the dimension of the instructors. Uh, because if we are to run such shifts, uh, maybe it might be overwhelming uh, for the instructors. So the recruitment of the instructors uh, to be able to manage uh, uh, such shifts, I, I think would be important. But the idea you suggest uh, is, is an extremely important. And then of course, uh, the cost of IT infrastructure, uh, this is well known to, uh, to all of us, uh, but I think something is being done at the moment uh, the fiber cables are being laid. Uh, in some places, even around Kampala, you can access actually a free Wi-Fi offered by the state. Uh, so there's some work along that line. It will take uh, time, but uh, hopefully those things uh, will change. Of course, the issue of uh, mindset change, it's a big issue for us. Uh, everybody still sees uh, technical and vocational education as, as for failures which is actually not the case. We are using Zoom. Zoom is uh, basically a TVET itself. Uh, so if the guys who are doing it are dense, then I don't think you would have the opportunity to be utilizing this facility. So the change of, uh, of mindset uh, also requires all of us, not just the state, uh, uh, but basically all of us. Now, just for information, the apprenticeship framework exists. We have the Uganda National uh, uh, Apprenticeship Framework that was developed uh, by the ministry responsible for labor. 
So we have one in place. We simply uh, have to get into uh, the implementation side. But before I uh, stop, I want to just provide a bit of information of what the government is doing. Uh, because sometimes when we talk, uh, everybody is very unhappy, uh, thinking nothing is happening at all. Uh, just for information, the government is uh, listening and the reforms are beginning to take shape. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the Tibet Implementation Working Group. We are working with uh, a Tibet policy that has been developed by government and already approved by government. So our role is to ensure that the Tibet uh, policy gets uh, implemented. And the Tibet policy addresses a lot of the things that uh, Laura, you pointed, uh, Laura, you pointed out, uh, including that we are developing an employer-led Tibet system. So many times we are complaining about the mismatch of skills, the inability of people to transit from uh, the technical schools right to the world of work, that has been addressed. We are developing an employer-led Tibet system, so the linkage with the industry has been strengthened. And that's why even the Tibet implementation working group as it exists now, it's basically dominated by us, uh, the private sector, by us, the employers. So if uh, something goes wrong, don't ask the government. You can uh, hold us accountable because now we have been placed in the driving seat to ensure that our system changes. What are the key reforms that we are looking at? First, we want to look at competence-based uh, education and training. So essentially, we are looking at the skill. Uh, we are not just looking at the knowledge. You know, education combines the element of skills, knowledge together with the attitude. So we are looking at the whole uh, spectrum uh, of, of competence, not only uh, the competences of skills, but also behavioral competences. Because employers are also concerned that the people, even when they're skilled, the attitude is not the right one. They are not able to work because uh, they have a negative attitude towards work. They are not self-driven. They are not able to deliver. So we are looking at a reform that is addressing it, the whole spectrum of, of, of skills and behavioral competences, issues of, of, of values as well. So that's the first one. And we're looking at it with industry standards. So essentially bringing, if we are to say, the world of work to school. So the collaboration between the industry and the uh, training institutions we want that uh, to be strengthened. Uh, alongside that, we are looking at the entire qualification framework, essentially a Uganda national qualification framework. And that addresses the issue you raised a lot of, the linkage between the lower and the uh, higher uh, aspects of education. We want that linkage to be possible, and that can only be possible within a qualification framework. If I've stopped at P7, I can as well still uh, go to a Tibet school and then become even a university graduate. So the pathways uh, would exist. So we are looking at a qualification framework. The other dimension we're looking at is recognition of prior learning. There are a lot of our skilled people you talked about, uh, for instance, recorded learning and all these things. Our traditional skills may be board making, uh, backlog making, they can't be recorded and learners can learn that uh, from home. So we are looking at recognition of, of prior learning and you can actually be certified as a, a backlog maker with the re uh, required competences and somebody can hire you to make backlog for instance for their hotel because you actually have a certification in making backlog. So we are looking at recognition of prior learning. We are also looking at the issue of instructor training because if we are to change our system to competence-based uh, 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 training and assessment, then we need the instructors to be able to deliver on that. So we are also uh, looking at uh, issues of in instructor training. And then of course, very fundamental, the public-private partnerships. Yeah. You speak about the issue of loans. In uh, Kenya, for instance, loans are already being offered by the government for TVET uh, uh, learners. But also in our case, we think that might not be sufficient. The investment required in technical education is much more. So we are considering the possibility of a training level and other funding options so that we, we can actually make the facilities available. 
These right. days, when we talk about artificial intelligence, for instance, when we are producing a product, it's not manufactured the mechanical way. We use 3D printers. Now we print a cup. We don't just uh, print uh, peppers, but we also print a cup. We can print a spoon. We can do all this. And the investment required for that kind of uh, a facility to be in a training institution is quite high. It won't be financed just by the tuition fees of the students. So that's why we are looking at the possibilities of training levies. And right. then lastly, my time is up. I know Gabriel, you, you already uneasy a bit, uh, is the issue of infrastructure, uh, which we are working with uh, several partners. Uh, but just uh, my final word for this uh, particular moment is just to reassure all of us that the government is taking the issue of skilling Ugandans quite seriously. And the, the, the critiques, the concerns that have been raised, including with, by myself, now we are responsible to ensure that that happens. So uh, together with you, we are open to welcoming your inputs. Now we are doing a lot of paperwork so that we can have the law in place. Now we already right. have the TVET policy. The next step is to have the law in place and we can establish a TVET uh, council so we can get these ideas rolling. So uh, next time things are not happening, you can look up to us. We are, we are responsible. And I think the government uh, is basically listening to us quite well. Thank you so much, Douglas. Thank you very much, Douglas. It's amazing how many times you've, in this presentation, you've taken responsibility. I wish we could all do more of that. You know, take up responsibility where things also have not gone wrong. Tell people, yes, if it doesn't go right, hold me accountable. Uh, accountable leadership. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Opio. You're also a dangerous person because I got so engaged in your discussion, I forgot I was supposed to be timing you. So, ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we need to move to the next presenter, but uh, panelists and the, attend, uh, the participants, the Q&A uh, you know, room is actually very active. Uh, Mrs. Magara, there are many questions in there for you. Uh, Mr. Opio has told all of us that uh, we should contribute to, uh, you know, the next steps in, uh, you know, coming up with the TVET law. They need ideas. Please direct any questions you have to him over there. Uh, Edward and uh, Justin, I have seen your question around uh, making available these uh, presentations. These presentations will be made available to you, especially the one of Mrs. Magara, because I know that that has been documented and that will be sent to you. We have a rapporteur team that's uh, putting together uh, everything that's being discussed, and there will be a report that will come at the end uh, of uh, this, uh, this webinar. So we'll just let you know when that report is ready and it will be shared with you. Now I need to move very quickly to our next discussant, uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick Cavoyo. You have seen him very many times on your TV sets uh, during this lockdown, Mr. Cavoyo has over 19 years experience as a teacher, administrator, and manager of education institutions, as well as education policy analysis. He's the National Secretary, Federation of Non-State Education Institutions. He's the Chairman, Eastern Region Local Government Audit Committee. Uh, he, is, uh, he is Chair of the Eastern A Regional uh, Local Government Audit Committee, in charge of all local governments in Busoga, Bukedi, and Sam in Bugisu. He plays a role of ensuring a sound financial management system, including risk management in the 29 entities he supervises. His role has ensured strong control and sound application of accounting functions and uh, operational control within the 29 districts and municipalities in the Eastern region. He's a member of the Education Sector Consultative Committee and a member of the Education Sector Policy and uh, management of the Ministry of Education and Sports. Mr. Kaboyo, you are welcome. Uh, please begin with a brief criti critique of uh, what was shared by Mrs. Magara, and then you can go to your presentation. Mr. Kaboyo. Thank you so much, Gabriel, and uh, viewers and participants. Um, following the numbers that are uh, trickling in are quite big. To start with, I want to First of all, thank CASO, the leadership, but the administration, and to be specific, Mrs. Magara, for the good paper 
presented. I want to say appreciations to you because when I listened to you and read the paper, I agreed that uh, there was a lot of thinking put in this paper. And I want to applaud you that for the 58 years since independence, we are seeing this coming now after all those years, meaning that for the previous years, we have not innovated, we have not thought through. So kudos to Castle and the team. But I also want to say that uh, most times for us in the private sector have a thinking that uh, government need to get out of the box and think differently. And the difference in thinking is to embrace innovation. When we discuss with the colleagues, sometimes we tend to think that sometimes government or public service abhors or has no appreciation for innovation. So if we are to take what this paper presents, then we have to ensure that we have to be practical and realistic and move away from the boardroom discussions, but put them on the ground. This is evident in the number of proposals that Lona proposes, which to me are very practical but we shall get challenges on how to implement them. For instance, if we are discussing having this TVET program, which most people in the countryside do, do not seem to understand, we need to link it with the other sectors so that it does not stand alone. For instance, we need to interrogate whether a student who participates in a cottage industry at home or does urban farming at home will appreciate the value in Tibet, but also we need to interrogate the admission system that we currently have as a country, which presents these students that have scored marks that do not speak to the Tibet that we talk about in the boardroom. And we also need to link other programs that government is implementing to actualize the real Tibet that we talk about, for instance, if we are pumping a lot of money in Operation Wealth Creation to beautify or improve agriculture, what happens to the school gardens that we grew up seeing in our schools? And can we find out whether they are functional, productive, and economically viable schools that have gardens where the neighbors can go and harvest tomatoes or crops that they the, the neighboring schools can feed on. But what we see is that, uh, by and large, students are being at school oh, without cool. food, and they are on empty stomach, even when we have land, and we also have the good programs. The other issue in terms of uh, practical application of what we are talking about is to ensure that uh, we implement the 17th Sustainable Development Goal, which is about part par 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 partnerships for these goals. You know, we are all now focusing on looking at Uganda in an isolated way, but we are part of the global village. We have 10 years to conclude the SDGs. So for you to have quality education, it means that you have to think aloud and have real financing that must uh, improve the outputs that you are looking at. For instance, if we have lots of money that we are sinking in, uh, for instance, the Youth Livelihood Program and the Women Entrepreneur Scheme, which are taking billions and billions of money, but we are here looking at uh, the education sector, not having an education fund. An education fund would be supported in terms of uh, amplifying research, catalyzing thinking. And also I would propose that in a program like this, the education sector ought to have made the biggest contribution for this, web, for this webinar, because it is the primary recipient and beneficiary in this, meaning that this should be the partnership we are looking at. But also in terms of listening, oftentimes, Public entities do not appreciate feedback or they prefer to move as they go because for us in the private sector, the issue is uh, results and timelines. We interrogate procrastination because we have targets. 
I think moving forward, government must set targets to ensure that after a certain time, there should be a realization of ABC. I would love to see this paper and the proposals that uh, Lona and Tim are proposing are fused and put into the sector to inform the agenda. I'm happy to note that uh, since independence still, it is this time, I think about two years ago that the ministry is moving in the right direction in terms of reform. The reform mode now has brought in the many policies that we had Douglas talk about the Tibet policy, there's the national teacher policy, there are other policies taking place, but uh, it is good to have policies, yes, but it is very good and good enough to have the population, to have the participants, to have the citizens know these policies because they are the beneficiaries. This therefore calls for meaningful engagement, participation, having ears on the ground to ensure that everybody is on board to avoid backtracking and also pro procrastinating on issues that could be addressed. And also want to say that uh, if we are really looking at improving as has been presented by the paper, we need to interrogate whether what is talked about is workable in the entire city. But as long as those in places of responsibility are not appreciating and will not make an improvement. So CASO should press and press hard to ensure that the good proposals made penetrate to the highest authority, catalyzes thinking, and also reawakens those that are sleeping. Because I know that when you are in a comfortable zone, you may not think aloud so much. There is a reason why it has taken 58 years to date without a think tank. There should be a reason I had Iguma announced that uh, our VC of Makere is around. My question has always been the linkage of universities and the Ministry of Education and Sports via research. I would love to see a component fusing in the number of researches that students do at different levels, right from the undergraduate to postgraduate, including PhDs that uh, have delivered something tangible. Okay, it's good that students do research and fill their books in libraries, you award them, but have we picked out some critical topics or critical issues that we can rally behind to discuss with the means of education to ensure that we are tangibly addressing social, economic, or even political issues that the students are putting in their good research. This therefore means that going forward, the Ministry of Education has to focus spending or funding for research at all levels, including a big contribution for innovations like this one we are having spearheaded by CASO. And also would want to say that uh, this webinar shouldn't be a one-off because as we speak, the sector is grappling with a number of challenges. We are likely to see the highest number of school dropout this time because parents are too poor to support the education. We looked at those that were learning as reported in the paper, but I want to tell you that uh, frankly, parents have been oscillating between negotiating whether they should buy food to eat or they should have internet bundles for children to learn. Even when children learn, you are worried as a parent because they can easily go into bad websites that are full of undesired content, meaning that the NITA U or National Information Technology Authority has to scale up and come up to ensure that there are control measures, but also internet penetration and access. When you travel to other countries, you reach at the airport, you have free internet, you go to places of public uh, engagement, you have internet. But here I don't think if you go to All Saints Church or Christ the King or let's say Macquarie University, you'll be able to access internet. Even at our airport, it's not as good as that. Of course, if 
access to internet is limited, is going to affect the teaching and learning process of the citizen. So it is incumbent to ensure that uh, our telecom companies are talked to by the sector, by the Ministry of Education, to ensure that there is a framework that comes in as a corporate social responsibility to ensure band provision or internet provision to at least a reasonable number of education institutions. But finally, I also want to talk about the public-private partnership more. This COVID has showed us that the way to go is to ensure a functional, relevant, but also practical public-private partnership. We cannot hide our heads in the sun to think that we are going to operate normally, but we have partner. If indeed we open schools as proposed by having candidates first, we should be in partnership to look at schools that are in the neighborhood that have space, having the numbers of children in the other school occupying those premises on a partnership for a short time until we open up fully. And we should be looking at the revival, for instance, of the fund that was meant for supporting some secondary school students in the country under the public-private partnership. Since the phasing out of that program, we are aware that many of those young boys and girls are the ones participating in criminality, are the ones that are getting pregnant because schools cannot uh, accommodate them, meaning that mm. education can only be delivered. All these mm. good uh, proposals that Lona has presented can be realistic right. if there is funding. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Cavoyo. And on that point that you have closed, uh, you know, there's a question from one Rachel uh, Ogola uh, speaking about emphasizing that schools are a place of safety and uh, what exactly is being planned uh, for this period when parents are going back to work because of the partial uh, release or uh, you know the uh, the lockdown and children staying home uh, but we will get a chance to respond to that uh, you also raised the issue of it's difficult when the choice you have to make is between buying bundles for the phone for your child to study and you should buy food for you and the family the child also to eat that's a very complicated, that's a hard decision uh, to make. All right, we need to move to our next uh, discussant. Our next discussant, uh, another person that's probably known to many of us, uh, Mr. Philbert Baguma. He is uh, the General Secretary of the Uganda National Teachers Union, UNATU. Uh, he has been in, the, in office from uh, April of 2018, and he has been working with UNATU since it started way back in 2003. Before uh, he, com uh, he completely took on office at UNATU, he was a head teacher of Murambo Primary School in the current Rwanda district, which was part of Kabale district. Mr. Baguma, welcome. And you realize that we have put our next poll question on, on your screens. Uh, Mr. Baguma, as you unmute your microphone, uh, just give uh, about 10 seconds for this poll. Let me just read it out. This time we're asking, is it feasible to expect national examinations to proceed successfully within this academic year? The options are yes, with proper interventions. The second is exams should be postponed to cater for lost time. And finally, exams should be adjusted to exclude uh, some content not covered. Uh, so far, most people are saying exams should be adjusted to exclude some content not covered. Please have your say. The poll is ending uh, in a few seconds. Uh, I see just 50% of us have voted. The rest of the people, uh, participants, please go ahead and vote. All right, uh, we will get the results of that, but uh, yes, majority of you are saying exams should be adjusted to exclude some content not covered. Well, we have the final results in. 
22% uh, of us are saying uh, exams, uh, yes, with proper interventions, so that uh, exams should go on, but with proper interventions, 23% are saying exams should be postponed to cater for lost time, and majority of us, 33%, or sorry, 42%, are saying exams should be adjusted to exclude some content not covered. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Baguma, you are welcome. Thank you, Gabriel, and um, the mm -hmm. attendees of this webinar and the fellow panelists. Um, I want also to thank the management of Castle Think Tank and thank Mrs. Rona Magara for the good presentation, which is rich in nature. Uh, first of all, in her presentation, she has highlight, highlighted a number of things. And among other gaps was the lack of readiness on the part of the Ministry of Education and Sports, but not only the ministry, but also the, the parents and other stakeholders. And as such, we were caught off guard. She indicated um, uh, on the limited capacity of the teachers, the lecturers, and so on in ICT, and which is an issue that needs to be taken on by the responsible centers. Poor infrastructure is common knowledge. Then <laughs> the parents who are not ready and who are ill-equipped you will realize that beyond the urban centers, most of our parents may not actually take on the, 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 the home study mm -hmm. process. And therefore, it leaves a lot mm -hmm. to be desired. Yes, this has been an opportunity because that's why we are even using uh, this webinar to interact. Previously, we would be now in a boardroom and we would be exchanging ideas. But this new innovation has come in because of the situation which very many have called the new normal. Online learning would be the best, but where are we in terms of this online learning and where do we think we can be in the next five or 10 years to come. In terms of connectivity, in terms of infrastructure, so that we are able to see it come and we, 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 we take it on. The homeschool model adoption, yes, but how does it take, how long does it take to train our, our parents and guardians to take mm -hmm. on the role of helping and assisting these learners. Some of the parents to a large extent may not actually be in a position to do this. Even those who studied, the curriculum they use is quite different from what is being taught in school today. And therefore, this also is a very big challenge. Although we look at it as an opportunity, but it can only serve a few. Then uh, continuous assessment. This is a very good idea, but how feasible or how possible is it in the Ugandan situation? Using the current teacher learner ratio. Continuous assessment has been around and has been talked about. When you go to most primary schools in this country, you will find continuous assessment forms in the cupboards. It was introduced, a lot of money was used to buy these phones, but finally it could not take off because of the numbers. And therefore, whereas we are looking at formative evaluation as opposed to summative evaluation, we must take note serious note of um, the teacher learner ratio because that is where the challenge is and that is where it lies 
double shift yes the idea is okay but how feasible is it in the ugandan situation we already have a testimony of some institutions which started double shift and the enrollment dropped drastically and therefore it also needs to be studied further what could have led to this and uh, the, the stakeholders bringing ideas together would give us an opportunity of where to begin from. The, the, the resetting of the school calendar to have a, a semester system. You will realize that parents and stakeholders have got the school structure as a safe place for the learners where to be and therefore when you have this time unless we are saying that this long holiday will be used for practical skills so that even when we are we, we, we are in a recess in between the semesters the learners are continuously being engaged in a practical work but when we say they have to keep at home, I believe it will meet a lot of resistance from the stakeholders because they are not used to that kind of arrangement. TVET or BITVET uh, coupled with the um, mindset change. We have a lot, a lot of work to do. When you go in the country, at primary seven or at senior four, more than 80% of the uh, candidates feel the option other than the bit of it. Actually, even when the learner is going for vocational, technical, it is an assumption that that one has failed or that one does not have school fees. And therefore, it's high time that we invested a lot in mobilizing stakeholders to change their mindset towards technical and vocational schools so that uh, a lot is done in that area because that is the way to go. Other than that, we need to have a reflection on the uh sdg4 in relation to the good document that was prepared by mrs rona magara one sdg4 is about inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all by 2030 and the main target is to have increased access to education, quality education for all, equity and inclusive with no learner left behind. Note that our ideas should fit within these targets of SDG4. And therefore, when we look at online learning, beyond the immediate crisis response, this pandemic has fully confirmed that distance education cannot repress school communities. The, the use of tablets, videos, TV shows, newspaper pullouts, and online platforms cannot repress trained, qualified, and supported teachers. The first face -first interaction between learners and teachers remains a major ingredient in achieving quality education. When you look at the, the, the coverage of the TVs, the coverage of the radios, the, 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 the coverage of the newspapers, you will realize, although we don't have the figures to know who has been studying and who has not been studying, you will realize that very many learners would have been left out. And uh, when you look at the practicability of the ideas, I like the, the paper, the ideas in the think piece, though genuinely thought provoking, do not 
every take into account the consideration of the realities on ground in Uganda's education system. As such, we need to interact and discuss more about these, uh, these ideas that have been brought by the, the, the castle think tank so Mr. that we can, we can move Bagumau. in the right direction. Yes, please. What realities? What realities are you referring to? I am talking about if you look at the connectivity within the Ugandan context. Okay. If we talk of online learning, how many of the uh, estimated 15 million learners are we talking about to be connected? Mm. If we look at the television uh, stations, what is the coverage? If we look at the radio stations, some places in Kampara here and Wakiso do not get the, the do, do not get the televisions that are stationed in Kampara. How about when you go far rural? So those are the realities. Okay. Uh, and when we talk of uh, even sending um, using social media, let's say WhatsApp. How many of the parents have got smartphones? We, we need to look at those realities so that we can put the, the ideas into the Ugandan context. All right. Uh, your time is done, but I just needed to find out from you. So we had a lockdown. People were not allowed to gather. Uh, actually, it was not advisable for you to leave your home. How else could the learners have been reached? That was the opening remark of Mrs. Rona Magara indicating that we were ill-prepared. We were mm. caught off guard. There was no infrastructure other than the classroom in interaction. Right. And therefore, in the event that we have learned a lesson, mm. we now need to look at the, the government needs to work out the strategy and start developing infrastructure. So that even when you are talking of online, you are not you are not benefiting those who are in the elite class and in the urban and semi-urban areas, but you are talking about all learners in the entire country. All right. Excellent. Mr. Baguma, we will come back to you with more questions. But if you could visit the Q and A, and this goes to all panelists, the Q and A tab. There are questions there, they keep, uh, the number keeps increasing. Uh, so please respond to those uh, so that uh, the participants are receiving answers to what they are asking. Uh, we need to move very quickly to uh, our next discussant, Professor John Mugisha. He is Vice Chancellor, Associate Professor, uh, and he's passionate about, he's a passionate academician. He's a leader in public health planning and management and an avid scholar of health service provision. His interests in health uh, planning and management has been, he has seen him become an international consultant on the subject. In 2008, he developed the guidelines for monitoring and evaluation of the health sub district management training in Uganda, uh, consultancy funded by the European Union. Prior to joining the Cavendish University uh, family, Professor Mugisha was the Dean Faculty of Health Sciences of Uganda Matters University. Uh, he's an accomplished, widely published scholar of public health planning and management. Professor Mugisha co-designed the Africa-wide curriculum for Master of Research and Public Policy for Partnership for African Social and Governance research. Professor Mugisha is widely traveled, having acquired his PhD from University of Kiel in the UK, uh, acted as the lead consultant for training in change management under decentralization for middle level managers in Lesotho. This was in 2011. And he lectured at Kiel University 2007 to 2010. Apart from uh, purely academic pursuits, Professor 
Mugisha is also a successful entrepreneur, having founded Rentovo High School in his hometown of Rentovo, Ntungamo district. The profile is definitely much longer like many of our uh, panelists, but allow me now to invite uh, Professor John Mugisha. Professor? Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, moderator, for your generous introduction. Uh, I actually didn't know you know a couple of things uh, about me. Um, thanks for the introduction, and it's a pleasure uh, to, be, to be invited to share one or two things. I want to thank the leadership uh, of Castle um, Think Tank for this consideration, for me, but for the Vice Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum, which I am representing, and uh, to thank uh, our key presenter, uh, Rona Magara, for a very, very wonderful presentation. I take note of the presence of Dr. Kedres uh, Three Agenda, who has been a role model. She just needs to know that when we are in secondary school, um, in Scripture Union, we always fought to go and attend conferences where she was a key speaker. Uh, I, I just needed to mention this. And also um, to salute my senior colleague, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, who uh, is participating in this webinar. So thanks, um, Mrs. Magara, for a wonderful presentation. Yes, you are very right. COVID-19 has caused substantial disruption. Economically, many businesses had shut down, tourism, hotel sector. Socially, we've had people being parked in houses and fights uh, erupting. Uh, as reported by police. Spiritually, churches have been shut down and alternative ways of uh, conducting prayer, paying your tithes and, and what have you have had to be thought about. Politically, I think systems that we thought were more politically as, um, prepared to lead um, in terms of change and challenge have now been highly politicized, and, and we see countries that we thought were more fragile politically, uh, providing even better leadership. But I want to focus mainly on education, uh, because that's the theme and, and focus for today, but also because I represent uh, the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum, where I serve on the executive as, as, the, as the treasurer. But I want to bring you also greetings from Cavendish University, Uganda, where I'm the vice chancellor. My colleagues who have previously spoken have discussed some of the things that uh, Madam Rona Magara has raised, and I will not go into some of the things that they that she talked about and and where they, where they made some some uh, they raised some areas of concern. I will just touch on very few of them. Um, one, of, on the priorities that we can look at, I agree with the presenter, things like homeschooling as alternative methods of schooling have become very important. Some of the previous speakers have mentioned the downside of homeschooling and I cannot agree more. But we are not going to throw this away because sometimes it is the only thing to do. And I think we need now to begin looking at homeschooling as a possible um, alternative model. And, and, and so this calls um, on the policymakers to see how this can be worked out and developed. It will also involve adult. Uh, education, training the parents and, and uh, to be supervisors of this kind of learning because this is actually going to be a reality. I have something about the double shift system. Uh, Mrs. Rona Magara has mentioned some benefits. I want to think that the double shift system 
may not necessarily be very efficient. It will reduce on the congestion. It will congest schools, especially primary schools that she demonstrated with. If you have P1 up to P4 coming and the upper primary school uh, children coming in the afternoon, you will congest the, the school campus. But in terms of decongesting the classrooms, where the biggest problem actually is, it's where you need to ensure social distancing. Um, if you want to decongest these classrooms, it will not be possible unless you split uh, big classes into smaller ones, where then you will actually need more teachers to teach the same people. Uh, so while the double shift system is important, uh, we need to take a bit of caution and see how to manage it because you can end up having more classrooms studying the same things, classrooms of, of you know, classes of, of children studying the same things because of the need uh, to ensure the social distancing, even within uh, the, the same shift. The other question, of course, is whether if we use the double shift system, we would be able to squeeze all the curriculum uh, to cover all the curriculum within the, the, the seven years of primary school, the four years of O level, the, the two years of A level and what have you. Um, I agree with Rona Magara on the opportunities created. Uh, she talked about the need to rethink alternative ways of managing learning assessment. And she talked about formative and summative assessment. I need to mention here that formative assessment and summative assessment are actually meant to serve different purposes. We talk of what, of, of, of what we call assessment for learning when we are referring to formative assessment. And when we are referring to summative assessment, we are talking about assessment of learning. Those are two different things. With assessment for learning, we are using assessment to further reinforce the study process, the learning of the, by the learners. When we use summative assessment, we want to see how much the learners actually have learned. And, what, and that's for the sake of knowing who has been able to learn and can progress to another level and who has not learned and may need to repeat that level. So then how can we solve the, the problems like the challenges we have where it is not, uh, where we are beginning to think whether it is even possible uh, to carry out the national examinations? I agree with Rona Magara that we need to focus more on formative assessment, but we also need to focus on summative assessment, but for shortened periods. Instead of teaching primary school pupils for seven years and then UNEB comes in at, at, at the end of seven years, we can use district examination boards. And so we use formative, we use summative assessment at primary, uh, at, at primary two or three, primary four, primary six, or then from primary four, we go to primary seven, and then UNEB can come in. UNEB can work with district examination boards comprising the teachers uh, that can be drawn either from a neighboring district or from the same district. Districts already have the mock system, mock exam system, and they are managing this on their own. And we need to train the teachers, build their capacity, so that instead of waiting for formative assessment at the end of four years of all level, seven years of, uh, of, of primary school, we can actually shorten the summative assessment duration, but continue also with the formative assessment. All right. Professor, you have uh, three more minutes. Thank you very much. Now, let me mention uh, that COVID-19 has presented an opportunity for universities to become innovative. We have identified ways of engaging students remotely, ways of conducting uh, meetings remotely, ways of continuing to function as in academic institutions remotely. For us in the Cavendish University of Uganda, we just, shift, we just switched all our contact students to our learning platform that was already serving distance learners. And we kept working, we had trained our staff to work remotely. And so I guess also a few other universities 
faculty boards, university senate council, even graduations. Just two days ago, we held our first scientific and virtual uh, graduation very successfully. Some some people probably on, on, uh, in, on, in this webinar would have followed that. But we also see that for the future and for the present, the need to switch online study cannot be an option. Universities in Africa cannot shut down completely when the rest of the world is moving forward. If we do this, Africa will be recolonized. We need to get ways of continuing to engage our students. And when we talk of online study, we don't mean that you must have a learning platform like Cavendish University has or, or Makere University or some other universities that may have learning platforms. You can start at a lower level use Google Docs, use simple email, and then get the universities with the capacity to train the others that need this capacity so that we continue teaching and learning. Let me mention a word of caution because I come from the public health background. COVID-19 is on the increase. It's on the rise. Those who are rushing to open universities, reopen universities and bring students on campus, you will be shocked if you get this, this, this disease spreading and affecting so many of the students. The risks are very high. I think it is safer for all, especially higher education institutions, to focus on how to integrate, how to adopt online learning and use it for teaching and learning. Because this can be done, this is possible. We are doing this, and I don't see why other institutions cannot do it. All right, because of time, we'll take one more point. Thank you. Um, I also need to mention uh, from what has been said before that we cannot, uh, that, that formative assessment has, has, has challenges. It doesn't have challenges. By the way, even in primary schools and secondary schools, whenever you complete a lesson, what they call a lesson, it's actually a teaching session, there, has, there is some kind of evaluation you make. That already is formative assessment. But you can structure it to be biweekly. And, 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 and if this is linked with the intended learning outcomes that the National Curriculum Development Center has identified, and which the Ministry of Education and, 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 and Sports has also identified, I don't see why we cannot integrate that uh, formative learning to reinforce the learning, uh, the, the assessment uh, of our learners, and then we combine it with short term. Uh, summative assessment, as I said before. Thank you very much, Professor. We will come back to you. Please remember to visit the Q&A uh, tab to respond to questions that are coming to you and the other panelists as well. I also mentioned that we have on the webinar, Professor Paul Edward uh, Mugambi. He is the Executive Director of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum. He's also referred to as the grandfather of mathematics in Uganda. Hopefully we will have a chance to hear from him. But now we need to go to the presentation from our special guest for today, Dr. Kedres Toriagenda. She is the Director of Education Standards in the Ministry of Education and Sports. Prior to this, she served for 13 years as a Commissioner for Secondary School Standards, a tutor and lecturer of chemistry at National Teachers uh, College, Kabale, a founder, head teacher, of Chinyasano uh, Girls High School and head of department and teacher of chemistry and mathematics at Waranyanje Girls uh, Senior Secondary School. She holds a PhD in uh, education management, a master's of science from Leicester University, a bachelor of science in chemistry and mathematics with a concurrent diploma in education from Makere University. She has also done a number of short courses in administration, procurement, training and others. She has attended, facilitated and presented papers on a number of national, regional and international meetings and conferences. She's a very hardworking, focused, goal and result oriented person who loves education with all her heart and puts in what it takes to ensure that every learner achieves his or her potential. She's a motivational speaker, God-fearing person and one of our uh, our panelists did tell you that she's associated with the old SU and uh, she's a celebrated educationist. Dr. Turi Agenda, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, 
Um, yeah, we hello? can hear you. Please go right. Please go ahead. We're we're ready for you. Excellent. Um, I'm I'm glad to be here uh, this morning, and um, I want to really express my great appreciation to the Castle team, but also to all the panelists for the great work they've done this morning in sharing on issues that are very, very, very pertinent for all of us, all of us who are participating today. So I'm really glad that we are able to meet in this way, in this new learning uh, which COVID-19 has brought us into. Uh, as others have said, we would now be in a room, in a workshop place, but we are able to communicate. And so I'm really uh, grateful. I do entirely agree with uh, Ronan on a number of things, and I'm sure that as we move forward, we will see how do we actualize them so that um, some of the issues that she brought up can be put in their right uh, context and be implemented. True, uh, education is a shared responsibility, and this responsibility sharing is for all adults, all adults, starting with the parents and guardians and members of families, the school system, the head teachers, the teachers, the governance of schools, uh, school management committees for primary, um, uh, uh, boards of governors and councils for higher education, the leadership at various levels, at national level, but also at local government level in our decentralized system and even at the lower local government level. So education is a shared responsibility. And if we are to achieve what we desire to achieve, all of us need to come forth and be able to do our part. Um, educational learning, uh, as Rona has said, and I would like to repeat also what the Minister of Education and Sports and the First Lady as said in her last two statements to the nation during COVID, is beyond the four walls of a classroom. As it was highlighted in our keynote, the knowledge, the skills, the values, and the attitudes cannot all be coined at school. They are both at home, in the community, and then at school. So when you look at educational learning holistically, then you realize that we have to do a lot more than we are doing right now. And I'm glad that Castle is putting together these thoughts. Um, in Uganda, I think most of us are running all the time, are trying to survive. And so we don't give enough time to think about issues that concern us, issues that are very critical for our young children, but issues that uh, we sometimes brush off because of other hassles of life. So, Castle, I want really to really celebrate you for putting that together. And that should work as a starting point for the rest of us, the adults, to see how do we contribute to our very, very precious gifts as a country, because our future is our children, and our children are our future, all of us. And so coming together to listen and to share and to discuss is a very, very big opportunity. I do agree with a number of discussions on what you've highlighted from Rona's paper. And I was quite excited by Mr. Opio uh, for him to be able from the outside the ministry to share with you that actually the sector knows a lot of these challenges. And the sector has thought through a lot of them. And it's out of this that both the TVET policy and the teacher policy have been developed. So, Mr. P, I want to thank you for really bringing to the fore the efforts under TVET, the whole aspect of competencies and skills, and not just the skills uh, that are manual or psychomotor but the 21st century skills as well. And you highlighted it quite well. So um, I do agree with quite a number of, a lot of the things that Rona highlighted and what the discussants have said. 
And I'm glad that our moderator has assured us that there will be a synthesis of what has happened today. And then we'll probably have another paper at the next level, which can be shared uh, with the people that are actively involved in the sector today. Going back to learning, uh, a lot of people, I think, as Rona mentioned, have a narrow way of thinking, or could I call it a misconception, of what learning is and where it happens. One of the very, um, very stunning things that we meet in everyday life is that people think that learning just happens at school, just happens in a classroom. It's not true. Learning happens from type of consumption of a little baby in the mother's womb, and learning goes on until you leave this planet Earth. It's a lifetime. So if learning is a lifetime, how do we take care of that group of probably three years up to end of university so that their learning can be holistic and their learning can be supported by the various stakeholders and adults who are supposed to contribute to it? Others also look at learning as from a person called a teacher. But who is a teacher? Is it just a person who has gone through a teacher training college or institution? Maybe not. The teacher is much more than that. The mother is a teacher, the parents, the siblings. So the teachers are more. And if we look at it from that, then we'll get more holistic learning. Others think about learning in a structured manner, where you have a certain prescribed curriculum and you have to sit on a bench for hours on end and face a certain direction and behave in a certain way. Yes, that's part of it, but it's not the whole of it. As I just mentioned, we are continuously learning. And so that cannot be the full description of what learning is about. And then uh, some of us, and quite a number of us in Uganda, still look at learning as that which gives you knowledge for a certain job you are going to do. And in most cases, we are looking at a job where you have an office, where you sit on a desk and have a laptop before you or whatever. But um, no, a knowledge and skills and attitudes can enable us to do much, much I'm sure those of you like this, the fact you learned at university, most of what you learned, you are not using it. Mm -hmm. I was lucky to uh, study chemistry and maths and to be a teacher, and so I was able to teach quite a bit of it when I was still actively in class. But a lot of what I use in my work is much more than what I learned at school. And in fact, a lot of what I use is what I learned at home from my father and my mother who never went to school at all. The ability to focus, to be goal-oriented, to be result-oriented, to achieve results, all this I learned is from my parents as we worked in the garden, as we picked coffee, as we did this. So learning and knowledge is much more. Many others also look at learning as one that will give you a certificate. And so we have all this strife about exams and the assessment system and so on. But indeed, if we are to get the Uganda we want with the people who have the right skills that can transform our country to meet our vision 2040, then we the adults who are on this forum, who can speak English, who can use these gadgets, need to go beyond that and work with schools and systems to see how this can change. As a sector, which I now represent really, our commitment as is in our vision, is to provide quality education and sports for all. And as uh, I think Mr. Waguma said, we wouldn't want to see any child left behind. We would want to see every child move through. In fact, our unwritten philosophy as the Ministry of Education is that every child can achieve. Every child can achieve his maximum potential as long as this child or this learner receives learning in a conducive learning environment. And a conducive learning environment does not mean a tiled classroom, 
if that was possible, it would be great. But it's an environment uh, where this child is healthy, where this child is fed, where this child is known, the child is loved and appreciated as an individual. The child is in the and the child. During this interaction, I was one of the learners on the Q&A who said our schools give us safety. And I think our moderator highlighted it. So now that parents are working, that one worried me a lot as an adult. Homes are supposed to be the point number one areas of safety. So if our children feel unsafe in our homes and feel more secure and safe at school, then we have an inverted society and an inverted well-being things. And these are things that we need to start looking at nationally beyond the education sector and see how do we change them? How do we change them? So um, COVID-19, I'm glad that a number of you on the participation of this webinar today have highlighted the fact that although it came with challenges, it was a wake up call for all of us. It was a wake up call for all of us to see how we have been taking things for granted, to see how unprepared we were to admit that our disaster, emergency and preparedness and response plan, which has been in draft for a long time, need to be picked up, dusted and used so that we don't just prepare for external and natural disasters, but we prepare ourselves for continuity of learning. So uh, the challenges that have come with COVID-19 are good challenges because challenges help us to think better, to think more, and to think outside the box, as my brother Patrick Kavoyo has said. As you are aware, as a nation, our greatest challenge now which is a good challenge, as the president usually says, is that we have a very high growth uh, rate, population uh, growth. Having a 2.3 to 2.4 percentage per year of population growth is a big challenge. It's a good one, but it's a huge one. Because we have that rate, and it does not tally, it's not in tandem with the rate of our economic growth. I know that many times we are told we are 6% growth, but in reality on the ground, I don't think so. So when we have that mismatch, we have all these about 1.5 million children being born to this country. It gives us as an education sector a moving target in terms of classroom provision, in terms of teacher provision, in terms of funding, in terms of you know, providing what we should to really bring up the quality education that we desire to have. So how do we manage this population growth to ensure that all our children are able to learn and learn effectively and acquire the right competencies that would make them useful as individuals, useful in their own communities at national level and beyond. So this is part of what motivated government to start our mass uh, programs of UPE and USE and WUPOLIT. And yet, when we started them, we were not extremely ready in terms of infrastructure, in terms of teachers, and so we have had struggles. However, it's again it's the same that governments uh, introduced and passed the liberalization and privatization policy, which has brought a number of um, other uh, players on board. So we are happy as a sector that we have our partners in the private sector to hold our hand and work with us so that all our children can learn. And I'd like us really keep this in view. We are looking at all our children. We are looking at almost 10 million children in the primary schools. And some of the areas which we are mentioned, which the discussants mentioned, have come back to this. So we have all these students, 70% of them are living in the rural. The socioeconomic stand in the rural of our country is not the best. 
it's not where I grew up, where we had sufficient food, where we were able to grow coffee and sell it and pay fees. Mm -hmm. Our rural communities have changed in terms of their attitudes, their commitment to work, and the way they look at life. So when we have all these young children with us and we have this kind of disaster that came through COVID-19 and suddenly every child is at home, how do we progress? So I was happy to see that question and its response. The efforts the government is making, are they adequate? No, they are not. First of all, it was our first time to venture there. So we are also on the learning curve, home learning, home schooling, um, uh, home materials for children to read. Who reads them with them? Are their parents able to read? No, a lot of our parents cannot read. But we had to make a step forward and I'm glad uh, from the results we get, um, uh, many of our children are able to learn. So we have picked these challenges. We have, of course, limited online access. It has already been talked about in a lot of our communities. They don't know what we are talking about. In fact, to them, there is no, there is no new normal because they've continued their life as usual. They are out in their gardens, they are back home with their children and so on. So, but can we move beyond this with this wake up call? Yes. We can, because now every one of us, and especially you and me, who are where we are in society, have realized that we need to do things differently and to be able to benefit everyone. One other challenge that we have as a sector, which I hope this COVID-19 will help us to really solve, is lack of motivation and commitment by our school systems. A lot of our public schools, are not doing what they should. Actually, uh, one of the World Bank reports indicated that on average, a Ugandan primary school child does four and a half years of actual learning instead of seven. So there is a lot of absenteeism. There is a lot of um, a, 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 a carelessness by the heads of institutions and the teachers themselves and the learners. I'm glad that uh, Philbert is here. I'm sure he's thinking, after so many months of children losing out, how do I motivate the teachers I lead to love what they do and do it with a passion and love the children they teach so that these children can have a future? So in the new normal, we have learned a lot of lessons and I'm thinking that we shall carry on with these lessons. I'm glad that we have such a kind of interaction today and that these thoughts we are now discussing can be carried forward and discussed at, at the next level and have our Uganda, have our country transform to what we want to be. There are already a number of efforts um, from what Rona was saying. There are a number of efforts already, for example, for the ICT for teachers. I want to say here that UNESCO has partnered with Ministry of Education through the Department of Teacher and Instructor Education, and they have established a hub at Shimon uh, Core PTC that is going to be um, a point for the teaching of all our teachers how to use ICT in their teaching. And this will help us uh, in some of the proposals Rona is bringing. Once the teacher know what to do, then it will be easier for them to use the ICT our facilities, ICT materials, and be able to teach and help our children to learn. Our greatest challenge, which I would like all of us to be part of, is the mindset change. Can we, the adults, unlearn and relearn? Can we look at life from another perspective? Can we look at possibilities and work towards making them real? Instead of continually thinking, well, this can't work, this can't happen, this is impossible. I'm convinced that once we have a positive attitude, because we who are on this uh, webinar today and others we can mobilize, if we commit and participate in sensitizing our communities for mindset change, in helping our teachers, our school management leaders in mindset change, then we shall go a long way to achieve what we want to achieve. 
Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. And so um, I know that my time is not too much, but as I conclude, I think I want to make an appeal. I think most of us today who are participating are Ugandans. I want to appeal that we love ourselves, that we love this very unique country, the only one in the world that is as it is. When we love this country and we love our children, we shall do what it takes to make things change. And I know that it will happen. And the lessons we've learned, we are going to pick them. We are already picking them and we are going to push them forward. For example, the issue of continuous assessment. As I think Philbert said, it has been on for some time, but now we are developing a policy on curriculum assessment and placement. And this is taking care of all those forms of assessment which we can use. And as you probably know, they recently launched the lower curriculum uh, uh, that we were, had just started on for senior one has already a component of continuous assessment. So some of these are already on the way, but we want now to pick them up seriously through this learning and see how in the future, in case of something like this, we'll be more prepared than this and learning will continue. So once again, um, castle leadership and management and the team that put this together Thank you very much indeed for these wonderful thoughts that we shall continue to think and debate on and get our children and our education sector improve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Turia Jenda, our special guest for this uh, webinar focusing on the education sector. Thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, thank you for also responding to the questions that were coming to you through the uh, Q&A section. Uh, all panelists, please finish, visit that section. I have visited it, and there's a question from Wambi Michael, and this goes to all participants. And this is what Wambi says. It is clear that not all the children have been learning because of the huge digital... Okay, let me finish reading that question. Uh, yes, they haven't been learning because of the huge digital divide between rural and urban Uganda. Then Wambi asks all of us, what should we do? We are interested in finding out from you what should be done about this. On your screens right now is a poll question. Uh, the time was already running. I'd like to ask the technical team to increase the time on that poll, but also to mute one of the microphones that's causing feedback. And this is what the question is. Given that private schools and universities are mainly business ventures and may, co uh, may compromise educational quality when profits are at stake, should the government take a deeper role in how they are managed, including financial support? So please uh, go ahead and vote. The time has been increased for the voting. And as we vote, I would like uh, to bring in a parent. Uh, many of us here are parents, but we've spoken about people in the rural and the divide and how difficult it is. I have a parent who is in uh, Bulisa district. Uh, he's from a fishing community called Biso. Uh, he's using uh, someone else's phone in order to join us for this webinar. So Stuart, thank you very much for availing your phone uh, so that uh, this parent can be part of this discussion. Uh, could we please hear from the parent and uh, hopefully on what the challenges, what gaps he has seen in, in this time uh, that have you know, affected in whatever way the learning of uh, his children. Are we able to have Stuart and uh, the parent? Okay, as we wait to get them on, I'd like uh, Audrey. Audrey, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, the person whose voice you just heard is Audrey Dralega. Uh, she 
she has a blend of national and international education experience and uh, she's done trainings, uh, many trainings, but uh, I'll just point out early childhood learning, special needs education, curriculum, uh, mathematics and curriculum science. And uh, she's, uh, she designed and delivered training both uh, at her schools in the UK and in the international sector. Audrey, so much has been said here, but let's start with this whole, you know, alternative learning, digital learning, uh, is it really possible in Uganda? Audrey, did you hear me? Um, that's a very good question. I've been reading many of the questions. Audrey. Because they've cropped up. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, now right. I can. Let me stop my video because then you might hear me better. Can you hear me now? Right. Yes. Okay. Um, the, the question hinges on one thing um, or several things that they're all... That they're all connected. Um, how do we bridge? Within the cities, we have people who have phones and, and iPads and computers. In the villages, um, most people will plug their phone in when they're expecting to make a call or when they're expecting to receive a call because power is an issue. The cost of the internet is an issue. Now, um, one of the things that um, our sister, Dr. Kedre said that really struck me was this. Um, it's very easy, of course, to, to look at the problems and to see, well, and to get discouraged by them. But basically what she was saying was we need to look and say, well, how can we, how can we achieve what it is we want to achieve? How do we turn the dream into reality? Now, there's, there was some research from years ago, um, a, a chap called Dr. Sugata in India. Some of you will have read or heard of his research. He put a computer through a wall in a slum. He connected it to free internet, and then he stood back to see what children would do. Now, what they did was that they first of all said, can I touch it? And when they were told, oh, sure, it's on your side of the wall, you can touch it. The children Audrey, Audrey, can you hear me? Audrey, can you hear me? Okay. We do have to think very carefully about it. Yes? Yeah, Audrey, can't could hear you, me. My sorry, could, is not could you just repeat what the children did when they asked, can we touch the computer? And they were told, yes, it's on your side of the wall. They started to experiment. And within um, a day, they had taught themselves to browse. Now, at the, those were children in the slums of India. And it was a good long time ago. This was 2002. What we have to realize is that the children in the village, the children in the slum, have the same the same range of ability as the children who are in Muyenga and Kololo and all the rest of it, the same range of ability. The question is access. How can okay. we create access? How okay. can we keep those children safe? Um, one, of, one of the people asked a very important question on special needs, Annette Birabwa, I think she, her name was, and another one asked about safety and protection. Those are extremely important points um, that we can explore as we go through this um, webinar. We, we mustn't leave out any parts of society. We cannot assume that everybody has a laptop or a, a smartphone or internet access or even consistent or regular power. Okay, all right, uh, Audrey, we have to leave it there. Let me try one more time to get in touch with uh, Stuart, who was very kind to avail his phone to a parent in Bulisa. Stuart, 
Can you hear me? Just a minute ago, I could see your icon and your microphone was muted. Okay. Yes, Stuart, I can see that you you are back on my screen. Uh, your audio is not enabled. If the team could just help you get your audio enabled. Well, just like we've said, uh, there are real challenges about uh, in relation to connectivity, especially as you move further from urban centers and uh, Stuart is in Bolisa. Okay, unfortunately, we haven't been able to make that connection. I'll keep monitoring it. And uh, if we still have time and that connection is made, I will go over to Stuart. Uh, now, very quickly, we have a number of questions that have come in and would like to thank you all for your participation. Uh, Mrs. Magara, I know you've responded to some of these questions, but uh, since we've spoken a lot about you know, uh, uh, using the internet and, and the tools there, Michael Kawoya asks, do you believe the consumers of remote learning services will adjust to it and accept to pay for the service? How can the gaps in the remote learning model be mitigated against to enable it gain quick acceptability by both parents and learners? And that acceptability goes as far as the cost. And uh, you had Patrick, certain times you have to make a choice between uh, connecting to the internet for your child to learn and providing food. Mrs. Magara. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. And, um all the panelists for the discussion that has uh, been taking place. Many of the questions, like you say, Gabriel, uh, around the issue of e-learning and the accessibility of, of this um, network and, and all the other facilities that are required for e-learning and whether or not the mindset uh, will change as often as or as fast as we want it to. Now, just, just to say that, look, like uh, Dr. Kedris mentioned, we have had challenges um, even before COVID-19 and the ministry has been trying to address them. Like she mentioned, our growing population continually presents a moving target as far as planning and, and uh, effecting those plans takes place. Now, in the midst of all that, you have COVID show up and the whole world is shut down and there's a total disruption of everything, including the, the, the sector of education. And so we want to be able not just to, to carry on what has been happening in the past and try and address the issues of the past per se, without considering the fact that we have a new dynamic altogether now. Um, like uh, Professor Magisha mentioned, we don't know how long this scenario is going to take place. How long are we going to be sh shut down? Nobody knows. Um, and so we need to prepare and plan, like we're going to be shut down, schools are going to be shut down for a long time. So the question is what do we have now that we can harness and address the situation that we have now? What is feasible in the midterm and the long term? So we, we need to, to kind of address our minds to not just the past, but what the situation pertaining now. Yes, we can say, look, going to school and having classes is the best mode of teaching. Agreed. But currently, what do we do? We're shut down. Do we stop teaching? Do we stop learning? Do students stop? Maybe. Um, and so we need to look at what is available. The challenge that has present that COVID has presented now has brought us to a point where we realize the Ministry of Education alone will not be able to solve the problem of learning of education in our country. It has to be a collaboration of several players. We need government to set in place, uh, review the policies and the enabling laws to be able to bring in the private uh, sector to be right. a key player. 
in, in resolving these issues, in addressing these issues. We need, if, if like uh, Dr. Audrey mentioned, access is key. And uh, I think it was also one of the panelists who mentioned that the radio station, the, the signal doesn't go beyond the town centers. So one of the key considerations we need to look at is how can we invest in infrastructure, not just government, but government and the private sector. How can we come to the table, look again at the infrastructure we have and make sure we roll it out across the country? What is it going to take? Right. And, and we are not looking at just the town centers. We're looking at the rural, rural places where um, a radio is, is, is a new thing. It's, a, it's something that's not um, available to everybody. But the example that Audrey gave is, is very pertinent. We can have, those are the virtual classrooms I was talking about. You can have a screen. I have seen kids in the road places coming around a small TV during football season, and they're watching a World Cup and the whole village is around that, that little TV station. Can we not do that for education? Can we right. not, as a ministry, together with the private sector, have a huge screen once a day where children in the community can come around and have learning happen? So there, there are things we can discuss, but they will not be resolved by one sector. It's going to be an intersectoral approach where we look at what can be provided, how can we roll out the structure, how can we assess? Remember, it's not just delivery of material. We need even the assessment. How does the learning right. happen? So who are the partners in that assessment? Parents have to come on board. So we need a parent, uh, government, private sector um, discussion. We need to have that discussion going rather than right. leave it to one sector of government to handle. Thank you, Mrs. Magara. Uh, Robinson did ask a question around assessment. And if you could uh, go to the Q&A section and just respond to Robin, if you have, Robinson, if you haven't done so yet. Uh, unfortunately, we have to move quickly. So uh, Mr. Mr. Kaboyo, for a lot of this, there's, there's a cost required. Are you know, private schools willing to take on these extra costs? And if I may put it in the words of Mr. Ephraim Tumusime, can the remote learning business model be a viable, uh, feasible option for social entrepreneurs in the education sector? Mr. Kapoyo. Thank you, Gabriel. Earlier on, I talked about thinking outside the box. And I, indeed, we need to kick the box from wherever we are so that we have a paradigm shift. What we need now is to think differently. When we think about small and medium enterprises, people attach such thinking to companies, Juakali, but they forget that private education institutions, whether small or big, are employing human resource. And all we are discussing hints on the capabilities and capacities of the human capital that Ugandans have. It is not debatable the role the private sector has played in the nurturing of Ugandans. So what we ask for is an honest demand for an education fund, which should be put in place. Should it be coming from the Uganda Development Bank or any other source? so that whoever has a number of students or a number of Ugandans to pay in terms of salary, in terms of utilities, in terms of wage involvement, that becomes the source. Because for sure we know that even the government is stressed in terms of accessing those resources. But also going forward, I think we need to innovate and think about how we are going to align our budgets. I would now expect that uh, government would be looking at uh, expenditure lines that have money line, which should be recalled to ensure that we do first things first. And this I mean, 
there should be a mechanism to establish exactly how many candidates we have in this country and where are they? What is the distribution? Are they too many in private schools or they are many in government schools? And if that is the case and we want to bring them back to school, can we share the classrooms that uh, are empty in a neighboring school to maintain the social distance SOP. And if that happens, then that is participation and partnership. We need to get out of the boardrooms and listen to the other voices that are bringing alternative views. In terms of having this paper that Lona has presented, it should ignite new thinking. It should spark the readiness that we need as a country. Imagine this has been COVID-1 attack. If we have the second COVID attack and things have gone to the worst, what are we likely to see? We are likely to see an element of lack of readiness. And when we talk about readiness, the first component for being ready is the financing. So we need the finances to be able to align the gaps that we have. And indeed, the public-private partnership can be reinvented to ensure that we are all at par. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kaboyo. Mr. Baguma, if you could tell us very briefly how the teachers have responded. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel. First of all, like I told you, when the president first made an address on 18th March. We had only two days to close all the institutions. And um, there was no option but to close. The, the, the schools which have resources managed to prepare some packages for the learners. Sorry about that feedback. Okay. Uh, technical team, could we mute everyone apart from uh, Mr. Baguma and myself? Mr. Baguma, go right ahead. To go with at home, uh, and uh, some of the schools have managed to continuously send uh, work to their learners via the social media. But of course, like I told you, there are some who are completely left out because they don't have access or they have to visit their neighbors to make sure they get something to, to, to help them. On the case of the teachers, the, the, the teachers right now are at home. They are locked down. Some of them have helped the, 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 the learners within their reach. Others have been waiting to assist and support in the radio uh, lessons. But this program did not take off per se because I think there was a hiccup in terms of budget and it did not um, take off as it was planned for earlier mm -hmm. in some parts of the country. All right. So, the, 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 the only challenge is now, uh, as we think of what do we do to move and live with COVID-19? Because obviously we cannot talk of post-COVID-19 when there is no vaccine. And when they talk of um, all these ideas that are highlighted in this document, like we said, they are very good ideas that when consultation is done, wide consultation, we can come up uh, and have a kind of readiness and change the status quo uh, in the current situation. Okay. We need to support the teachers, first of all, also in ICT. And that calls for adjustment of training programs, we need also to have an investment in building a national portal for uniform online distance learning that puts into consideration the, uh, the different learning options 
including the home environments uh, and have the abilities improved for all learners to benefit from such an eventuality because okay. this has been an eye opener all right without going deep into the detail uh at the beginning of this year teachers went through a process of retooling uh in order to be able to you know deliver the new curriculum for lower secondary and that took just a couple of days what in your estimation uh what period would be needed to do this training of teachers to uh, move to the e-learning of course training must be continuous because you cannot master each and everything in a certain specific given time and therefore we need to have the initial training and then the training remains continuous as okay. a kind of professional development all right there's a question from maria justin and uh, she's emphasizing you know the importance of the face-to-face -face, uh interaction with between the teacher and the learner and uh, her question is how do we involve the teacher in this because even with this uh the situation we are in the face-to-face -face is very important how do we involve the teacher to get this moving in this arrangement now we may need to think of um having an arrangement within the village or within the homesteads to have that kind of interaction because we are not supposed to move uh, here and there and yet there is a need for these children who come from families where the parents or guardians are illiterate or they are semi-literate and cannot support the learners in mm. whatever they are doing in as far as education is concerned so there is a need for a model like people are proposing um home home learning we need to think of maybe something around the village and then have a model where the teachers can have an interaction of course taking care of social distancing okay thank you very much use the social places okay like uh, churches like a playground there and have that first face okay thank you mr baguma professor uh, professor mugisha professor mugisha are you there I was muted. Uh, I can okay. hear you. All right. Uh, I'd like to begin with a question from uh, Hussein J. Conan. He asks, uh, the National Council for Higher Education wants universities to get strong on online education and training. Do you think this is realistic in Uganda? What are the likely opportunities and challenges? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Conan. Um, yes, it is very feasible. And I think we have just delayed to emphasize this. This should have come a lot earlier, um, much earlier, because universities need to network. Mm. How do you network without having some kind of online capabilities? How do you do this? Second, we know that in universities, we are not only benefiting from the teachers that are there giving instruction. We are benefiting from other professors in other countries. And we also have online courses that we build within our curriculum to help us achieve the intended learning outcomes. Many universities are already used, uh, helping their students to, to, to they are integrating Coursera uh, courses. Uh, they are integrating cubicle courses like we are doing uh, at Cavendish University of Uganda. So this is something that all universities should do. Is it feasible? It is feasible. The all way right. to do it, you don't have to begin with a complicated uh, online learning platform. Just begin with the simple ones. Use Google Docs, use email to share content, and help, of course, teach you, train your students to be self-directed learners, and then uh, build a platform through even network, collaborative network, building collaborative networks. It is all something right. that universities can do in a phased manner. Early in the lockdown, there is a university, UCU, that attempted 
to you know uh, administer examinations and uh, they were stopped. Uh, how will the aspect of examinations be handled? And the president did add a question, you know, uh, how will the invigilation be done? You see, invigilation can be done physically, but also online, electronically. You can actually do invigilation. Uh, it depends on, the, on, on how we set. I want to emphasize, even if Cavendish University of Uganda, for instance, where I work, does not administer online exams, even for our distance learning students who use the, the, the platform, they come and sit exams with their counterparts who are on the contact mode. However, I know that it is possible to do online assessment. I have taught at Queen Margaret University and at Kiri University, and we're actually giving online uh, assessment and even ensuring that the candidate across is the, is the very one answering the examination. So this, this can be done, but of course we need technological uh, preparation. We also need to train our teachers because I was trained to do this. All right. We also need to know that at a postgraduate level, uh, a lot of formative assessment is the one that is in fact needed rather than summative assessment. So um, I, I think Uganda needs to get ready actually for online assessment because it is actually possible. And the area we train ourselves and equip ourselves to do it, the better. All right. Uh, Mr. Opio, you have attracted a question from Professor Barnabas Nawangwe. He asks, he says first that the point on the need to promote uh, TVET cannot be overemphasized, especially with our fast growing population. How do we achieve success with the extremely big dropout rates at primary and secondary schools? Is there something we are not doing right at these levels of education? Thank you so much. All right. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Professor. I think there are certain things we are not doing right at the moment. And that can change. One is that our education system is not skills oriented at all. It's not oriented towards uh, competences. For instance, if somebody went up to primary seven, other than reading and writing, the person doesn't have any other skill at all. So essentially it's easy to drop out. But if competences are defined at various levels, then it's possible. It wouldn't be drop out at all. You would have just completed a particular phase of education and then you can rejoin at a later stage, you can go and work, uh, because learning is lifelong. So that's, that's one challenge that I see at the moment, that uh, we, are, we are not focusing a lot on the competences, a lot on the skills. So people go through the school system, they don't actually quite understand why they study. If somebody dropped out of uh, O level, they wouldn't understand why they did I spend all this time uh, studying up to O level because they don't have any particular competences or skills, they have only the basic ones, uh, reading and writing. I, I think that's, that's one of the things. But there are, of course, various other reasons that are responsible for, for the dropout, the nature of our communities, poverty, and all these other things. But from an educational point of view, I think we need to address the issue of competence. All right. All Skills training is basically you know, viewed as uh, requiring contact. And therefore, when we have a lockdown, uh, isn't it even affected beyond the other? Because how exactly would e-learning be done for you know, skills development? Yeah, I, I think uh, you, you ask an interesting question, but skills, there are various kinds of skills. Uh, even during this time that we are at home, a lot of non-formal training is going on. A lot of people are learning how to cook uh, new uh, types of food. Uh, a lot of people are learning various skills. So even uh, practical skills can be learned online using YouTube videos, using uh, tutorials, uh, but also other very important uh, kind of uh, competences, like behavioral competences, the way to to contact yourself uh, even as a person. So there are various kinds of skills that can be uh, administered online. You don't necessarily have to 
uh, sit inside a classroom to acquire certain skills. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Kedris. Doctor, your questions are many. Uh, let me pick this one from Ernest, where uh, Mr. Uh, Katwesi-J asks, the government seems to be discouraging efforts by private institutions to continue the education process. For example, there has been negative feedback on online education, e.g. by private universities and international schools. Does this make, doesn't this make us lag behind? Dr. Turi Agenda? Ernest for that question. Um, I don't know whether it's true. I don't think it is. Um, first of all, um, I don't think they are discouraging universities from using um, virtual and online um, systems. I had someone um, mentioning what happened at the UCU case and what really happened I would want to explain was that um, uh, it was when we had a complete shutdown. It was not like now when people can walk their nearest small towns and maybe access an internet cafe. And so some of the students from UCU who are completely stuck at their homes and couldn't access any internet, couldn't access, couldn't charge their phones, uh, brought up a complaint and they said, we are going to be left behind. And as a sector, we had to intervene. So we shouldn't keep quoting that the time that we are in is different from the time then, because the first two weeks was complete uh, lockdown and nothing was happening, no movement was there. Now, um, concerning, um, uh, I, I think what, what he's asking, I think it's not adequate information being given to the public, but um, we are not discouraging any initiative. What we are on as a standard is that if an institution, a school has an initiative, it should assure us that all their learners are benefiting. Okay. That they are all Doctor, 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 just before you move from that. Yes. The government initiatives are not benefiting all the learners, and yet government is still continuing with those initiatives. Isn't it uh, unfair that the, the private schools are required to get all the learners on board and prove it to government, and yet government's initiatives are not taking on board all the learners. Um, thank you. I don't know which initiatives, but I want to, 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 to say use, something about We can use the TV, the radios, the materials that have been sent out. Not everyone is getting them. I want to use that very example. Um, as the, I think Phil Bart or, uh, or Patrick, I don't know who said, when the shutdown came on and it was very uh, instant, uh, some schools and some institutions made efforts to keep their children learning. And those of you are in Kampala, I'm sure you saw lessons on televisions and uh, uh, um, Central, Central Radio of Uganda started a program. And as a sector, we realized that uh, that was benefiting a very small group of learners. And so we sat down and said, how do we reach everyone? And that question is still on even up to now. And we decided we could use three modes so that we can reach everyone. So the first mode was that those who could access information on television would go ahead with it. But a very big uh, number, more than 70% from the statistics available, would access radio. And that's when we introduced the radio component, not just uh, in radios here in Kampala, but radios across the country. And then the third mode was that there are some even who can't access the radio. There are some where the radio belongs to daddy. He goes with it to the drinking place. And so once the radio is off, the children cannot run. So we said, okay, in view of that, let's also produce some uh, set of study materials. And we go into the print. So the three modes were actually supposed to reach everyone. Clear instructions were given to local governments when we sent out the print material. And we said, prioritize the least served by both radio and television. But of course, they were less than we, we had intended because of the finances and they have had issues of accessibility, but that is still our target. We want to reach All everyone right. with as many modes as possible. All right, thank you very much. Uh, there's an idea from Gladys, uh, sorry, from Grace about using the Vivanda style video uh, holes for uh, community learning. 
Uh, and there are many other suggestions, good suggestions from many of us. Uh, we'll continue taking note of what's taking place in the Q&A section, and uh, it will be included in uh, the report. Okay, I've been informed that uh, the parent who is in Bulisa is now online. Stuart, could you please unmute your microphone? Let's speak to the parent and just find out how they are managing in this time. Yes, many things. Technical team, can we technical team can we mute the other people? Just uh, Stuart and myself stay unmuted. Thank you. Okay, I'm to just on a parent. And we are privileged that the government has put in some programs to enhance our children, even study during this uh, uh, this pandemic of COVID-19. The only problem is that the materials distributed by the government are, are inadequate. And uh, being inadequate, since we have a multiple a multitude of learners in our rural setting. So we are, face, we are getting, or we are facing challenges that some of our children are failing to strictly follow what is going on. And in that regard, that is why we are now trying to solicit some assistance from, uh, from NGOs around us like LACUADO, so that they can photocopy, if they can photocopy, uh, those materials to to help our children access them. But otherwise, we are very pleased. And since this one is an electric moment, whereby when you delay it, it means the world would have uh, left you. Left you behind, yes. So we're yeah, very... We left you behind. Yes, sir, so we're very I'm glad that you're, sh that you're sharing your yeah, experience with us. And I'd just like to ask, thank you for sharing your experience with us. I'd just like to ask, how exactly, for example, you as a parent, what are you doing to ensure that the learners who, you know, you take care of stay, you know, uh, the course of their learning? How, how, what exactly are you doing? Uh, when the program is on, some of, uh, some of us who are a bit educated, we sit with our children and start following what is taking place over the radio because for us here, we cannot access the TVs and so on. So we are using the radios, but it now calls for the parent to be very keen in making that he puts the direction properly. Okay, do you know what the uh, parents who are not educated are doing in that case? That is now a great challenge because now those, for those who are not educated, it becomes a very great challenge because what I know, they are just, uh, Actually, their, their children are being left behind. Okay, sir, so thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have much more time to continue with you. There's a lot more we would have wanted to ask you, but unfortunately, we have to move on. But we appreciate you joining us for this discussion and, and continue to give support even to uh, the parents in your community that may not be uh, uh, educated. Okay. Uh, I know that uh, Professor Nawangwe is joining us via Facebook, therefore he won't have the ability to speak. We would have been good to ask him because we know that uh, Makere University, there was a statement that was leaked. It was a half prepared statement, therefore it was retracted and what have you. But uh, we have uh, the executive director of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum, Professor Paul Edward uh, Mugambi. And I did mention earlier on that he is referred to as the grandfather of mathematics in Uganda. Yeah, could you tell us what the what the uh, you, the vice chancellors are thinking? As in, how are they going to move forward uh, to ensure that uh, the learners, uh, that their students, actually continue to learn? Not only the not only the uh, finalists. Professor, could you hear me? We can hear you. All right, P please go right ahead and me? respond. Uh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, you got a vice chancellor. had a meeting with the National Council of Higher Education to brainstorm on, on the way forward. They've got some very uh, burning problems. Problems of maintaining salaries for staff is a major issue. 
universities, private or public, heavily depend on fees by students. But then if one says that only the final students come in to do their final exams, those will not provide enough funds to cover the costs of staff. And by staff, not only um, the lecturers, you've got the technical staff, the maintenance staff, you, all, you open up the whole university just for a few people who cannot financially support. That's one issue. Then for years, it's the issue of taxation. Taxation is a burden that the universities have been born for a number of years. Uh, because again, they depend on, on, on fees of students. And then if you <laughs> put on the burden of, of taxation, things become very, very difficult to, to run a university. Right. But um, uh, the Uganda Bar and Science Forum has come up with some ideas that have been documented. Our chairperson, Reverend Dr. Senyun, has done a wonderful job of writing up a document that we have submitted to government in okay. this regard. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at our time here. Uh, and we have to bring this to a close, unfortunately. So I'm going to come to each of the panelists and uh, I'm going to ask you to give your closing word and I'm going to take it in the order of presentation apart from uh, for uh, Mrs. Magara, uh, who I will move towards the end. I'm going to start with Mr. Uh, Opio, your closing word. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel, for the excellent uh, moderation. Um, I'm quite Thank happy you, sir. Thank you very much. I to uh, be part of this. Uh, thank you uh, to the listeners and all the participants. Very useful insights we have got. I think as uh, policymakers and people who have a role to play in the education space, this has been extremely informative. Uh, just to reemphasize again, we have a clear agenda. We are moving towards Vision 2040. Uh, within the education sector, our priorities are directed uh, towards that. So thank you so much. Uh, let's keep the conversation uh, going. And, and we together, we can make our country better. Let's stop this business of complaining. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's continue the conversation. If you visit the Facebook and the Twitter pages of uh, CASO, those conversations are going on. But uh, for those of you who are asking about the presentation, you will find it on the CASO website. And uh, I will read that website to you before we end for the day. I just need to uh, get it uh, so that I read it accurately. So I will be uh, referring to that uh, very soon. Uh, Mr. Kaboyo, over to you. Thank you, Gabriel. And to thank the CASO Think Tank for this effort. Our call from the private sector is that uh, such meetings should be not once in a while, but we need more of these to put issues to the table. And our strongest request is to have funding that is going to address the gaps that we are having. But we'd also need to see the Minister of Education and Sports pick up some quick policy issues that we need to discuss in terms of going forward, in terms of readiness, and we'd also want to see whether the budget alignment will be looked at in terms of supporting local governments. You know that uh, most primary schools are run at the local government. But I also want to know that uh, this should be a starting point that going forward, we are going to have a number of education think tank discussions going on, both on TV but also online because uh, there are many parents who would want to pick out issues from this. And lastly, I would want to ensure that by, to see that by the end of uh, May and beginning of June, we have every child in this country accessing internet, facilitate this e-learning with ease because 
learning now is going to be through access using internet. And if all children cannot access that, then we have a danger. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kaboyo. Uh, now, let me uh, come very quickly to uh, Mr. Philbert Baguma. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for the moderation. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Rona, for the thrilling presentation. Thank you, panelists and all other attendees for your contributions. I want to say that there is a need for our Minister of Education and Sports to set up contingency capacities to mitigate and manage emergencies and risks in the future. There is also need to invest in developing the infrastructure for e-learning so that in any case, we get another pandemic or an emergency, we are not caught of guard as it were this time. I would also like to see Ministry of Education and Sports coming up with a supplementary budget because all this we are talking about will finally require funding. Whatever uh, possible solution that is being talked about will need funding. And therefore, there is a need for a supplementary budget to plan. And let's keep this discussion, in, in, improve on the um, stakeholders so that at the end of the day, we can have policies that will move the Ministry of Education and Sports from where we are to another level and be more prepared for any other eventuality. I want to, to also thank the Castle Think Tank for this initiative. It has been a very nice one at the right time, and I think it is going to go a long way in helping us to continue discussing about these issues that we are raising. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Baguma. Uh, I should be uh, bringing Professor Mugisha in, but I remember a fascinating question that I read uh, from uh, 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 Conan Businje to Professor Onyu. And since I, uh, Professor Onyu spoke earlier, it may be unfair that uh, we don't let him respond to this. So Professor, do you think e-learning can now form blended learning in universities or it's just a fallacy? Professor? Uh, thank you very much. I think presenters, hello? Yes, please go right hello? ahead. We can now hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I think, yes, I think the way to go is actually e-learning, but I think we need um, a more blended approach because already, even in the past, uh, many people have tried to use the blended approach. For example, in, in many university institutions, I know that the lecturers send materials online and then in addition to that, they have face-to-face -face sessions and so forth. So I think that um, a blended approach to, uh, to learning is, is very possible. And I think we can um, interrogate it further so that we can see uh, what combinations of, of delivery modes can best give us the, the best results. So yes, I think it is a very good approach. Professor, thank you very much. Now let me go to uh, Professor Mogisha, uh, your closing word. Uh, thank you very much, moderator. And I thank um, the leadership of Castle uh, Think Tank uh, for organizing this and, and also the, the speakers that we've had. Um, two concluding remarks. One, for government, in as far as assessment of primary and secondary school 
uh, is con uh, students is concerned. We need to emphasize formative assessment and get, get, get the assessment re results recorded. We also need to shorten the duration to reform the summative assessment. I have talked about UNEB delegating its role to district examination boards that can be created so that you can have summative assessment at P3, P5, and P7 instead of P7 only, at senior two and senior four instead of senior four only. So that in events like this, we are able to be able to promote students to the next level, but also waiting for uh, keeping a student studying in order to do a final uh, exams at P7 after seven years, uh, I think we could do better than that. And for universities, I think governments should not discourage universities that are coming up with solutions uh, and interventions uh, to help uh, academic delivery to continue, but should in fact support them. We realize that it does us no good to shut down teaching and learning when other countries, even in our neighborhood, are actually continuing to study. So what should we do? Let's embrace technology. Let's encourage those who already have solutions to work with those without solutions so that we can bring up our higher education institutions to perform at global standards. There is no way we can shut down. And, right. and I think the area we, uh, we, we, we adopt this transition and get it guided by the National Council for Higher Education, which by the way is being very well. I must commend our, our executive director, Professor Kapoor and, and the team that she's working with. The area we adopt this, the better for the higher education uh, sector. I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, let's go over to Mrs. Magara. Thank you very much, Mr. Iguma, for the great moderation you've done. Uh, the <coughs> presenters for the critiquing of the document and, and the great feedback that has come through. And also for CASO for giving us the opportunity to look ahead considering the challenges that we're experiencing today. My parting comments would be that the way ahead is collaboration. No one institution, whether government or the private sector alone will be able to forge a productive way ahead. We need to collaborate. The vision of the ministry is quality education and sports for all. The idea is to pre prepare and, and train a manpower that will provide, um, that will provide um, opportunity for government to meet the needs that we have. There are several areas that we need to look to concern, concerning the situation we are in. One, continuity of learning, two, materials, access of materials through quality of learning, then the manpower development and the quality of manpower that will come through as we take this next step. And to have all that happen within the confines of that have been presented by COVID, we are going to need collaboration. And therefore, I'd like to ask that together as government, as the private sector, as parents, we come to the table and thrash through all these discussions and, and suggestions that have come forward, because each one of them has an effect um, mm. on society, has an effect on different players. We may suggest e-learning, but what's the impact on the rural community? What's the impact on the ICT and the telecom companies? What's the impact on right. taxation on the city? So there has to be a synergy of, of effort that takes into consideration the impact on, on the whole of society. That okay. can only be done as we are working in collaboration. So my parting shot is let's collaborate. Thank you very much. Let us collaborate. Dr. Kedris to the agenda. Doctor? Dr. Turiagenda, our special guest, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Oh, great. Um, one, I would like to thank CASO for this organization for bringing us together. 
Thank you, Rona, for a very insightful presentation and your great comments. I can't agree with you more that collaboration is what we have to get to. We have to look at ourselves as one people, one Uganda, one country, one, one people with one aim of making sure children are learning. And once that is in, then there is no they and us. It's all of us. As we are all aware, um, our quality of education was our niche as a country in the region of Africa and beyond for a long, long time. We have to pick ourselves up and get there where we used to be. And I think this is possible. So I'm confident that all these that have come out will have a way of having them discussed. As I sat here and listened, I thought how I wish uh, many other people that sit on top management and other areas had been able to be brought on board to access uh, the conversations that have gone on. So I'm looking forward to the progress of this conversation after here to get many more people so that we get tangible outcomes out of the thinking and the discussion that we have had today. I was excited to hear my professor Mugambi who taught me maths and see that he's growing strong. Yes, we can be more efficient. We can be more focused and be able to achieve more, whether at the lower uh, education levels, but especially at the university levels. And I really want to challenge universities. We need to come out and set an example of how these systems can work for continuity mm. of learning. Thank you yes. very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And I will just pick up from what Dr. Turiaja and our special guest has ended with. A lot of research is being done. And many times our research is donor driven. Our research does not look at the problems we have as a country and generate solutions for those problems. Let's focus our research on fixing the problems we have as a country. And yes, in this time, if we get certain things wrong, we can blame it on COVID. But uh, let's try, let us try. Would like to thank all of you for joining this webinar. I hope it has been fruitful for you. There will be a document that comes out as a result of the discussion we've heard. And let's push forward and move to action. There are many people to thank the panelists, every attendee. Uh, you know, we had many professors join us today. Uh, I did recognize uh, the Vice Chancellor of Macquarie University, but we were also joined by uh, Mrs. Pamela. Uh, Kaliajira from the National Council of Higher Education. She did teach me some aspects of law. She was my dean for some time. Uh, we have the Castle, uh, we have the Castle Advisory Board, uh, Dr. Magara and uh, the team. Unfortunately, we can't recognize all of you by name, but I uh, would like to recognize uh, Professor Vicent uh, Anigbogu from uh, Lagos, Nigeria, Mr. Newton. Uh, Baloyi from Johannesburg, South Africa. This just goes to show you that this conversation was not just, uh, oh, you know, within Uganda. And even in Uganda, you, you had from somebody from Bulisa. I recognize some people from Lira, uh, people I used to work with, uh, go and see in Lira. Uh, and all over the country, many people joined this discussion. Okay. I informed you at the beginning that this is the second webinar, and we're going to have a number of them. Uh, touching on different sectors. Next week, we will be looking at um, the food supply chain. So please, if you are interested in that discussion, uh, visit the website or follow our Facebook and uh, Twitter pages to find out uh, how you can be a part of the discussion. We will put these up on those uh, page on our various pages, but the website, the Castle website is www.castlethinktank.org. Org. Our Twitter handle is Castle uh, underscore ORG, Castle underscore ORG, and Facebook is at Castle ORG UG. Thank you very much, everybody. Until next week, goodbye. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.